This is Chapter 10, Clinical Decision Making for Periodontal Care. So how do we make a decision on what to do once we've gathered all of our data? Process whereby all members of the dental team use the information gathered during the comprehensive periodontal assessment to arrive at an appropriate diagnosis and identify treatment strategies that meet the individual needs of the patient. So all members and individual needs of the patient are two key parts of this whole big sentence I just read. Clinical decision making um, involves all of your team members and your patient as well. We need to keep in mind that when we're drawing up a treatment plan for the patient, we have to listen to um, the patient's needs, but not only do we need to address the patient's needs, we also need to take into consideration the patient's wants. Um, listen to your patient talk. We may know exactly what the patient needs, but what the patient needs may not necessarily be what the patient wants. And so we have to kind of listen to and find um, and draw up a plan that addresses all of the patient's needs based on what their ability is to meet those needs. Planning periodontal treatment, step one, assigning a correct diagnosis or diagnoses if the patient has more than one known periodontal condition. So the fundamental diagnostic question should be, does the clinical assessment indicate periodontal health or inflammatory disease in the periodontium. Um, if the clinical assessment indicates inflammatory disease, is it gingivitis or periodontitis? If the patient has gingivitis or periodontitis, what type? So from here, we're gonna draw like a diagnostic tree. So a decision tree for determining a periodontal, periodontal diagnosis. Does the clinical assessment indicate health or disease? That's the first question you should be asking. Does it indicate health or disease? If it's health, you go one way. If it's disease, you go the other way. So if they answered it's disease, does the clinical assessment, or um, if it's health, no further diagnostic decisions are needed. If it's disease, further diagnostic decisions will need to be made. So the decision should be based on signs of inflammation or basically signs and symptoms. Signs, um, the difference between signs and symptoms, signs are observed and measured by the clinician. What do I see going on? The signs of inflammation, the signs of disease. Um, symptoms are what does your patient see or note? So um, what kinds of things do they feel? Some patients are totally unaware that they have a disease. In fact, most of your patients will be. So we're going to decide between signs and symptoms. We're going to listen to both. Um, signs of the disease. So the signs were what do you see? Gingival erythema or redness, gingival edema or swelling, bleeding on probing, clinical attachment loss, mobility, bone loss. Those are all things that are signs of disease. Color changes, um, contour changes, consistency changes, bleeding on probing. So on our decision tree, second question, is the disease gingivitis or periodontitis? So um, the natural level of gingival attachment is slightly coronal to the CEJ. Clinical attachment loss is apical migration of the junctional epithelium from the CEJ toward the root apex. So in other words, the tissues moving down the cementum of the root. Um, Gingivitis has the presence of inflammation, but no clinical attachment loss. In other words, any deeper probing depths you're getting is from gingival inflammation. It's from the gingival, gingival margin moving coronally on the tooth, not from the gingival attachments moving apically. Periodontitis has the presence of inflammation, but there is clinical attachment loss. In other words, the attachment of the junctional epithelium is apically migrating down the root of the tooth, and bone loss is seen on radiographs. What And question three then, what type of gingivitis or what type of periodontitis do we have? So we can classify gingivitis as mild, moderate, and severe, or diffuse, 
um, papillary, marginal. We talked about all those terms a few chapters ago. Or we classify the periodontal disease. Um, if it's an implant, we're going to classify the peri-implant disease. Recognizing the need for flexibility. Flexibility is a realization that the important fundamental decision as to the presence of either gingivitis or periodontitis may not describe the overall periodontal condition of the patient. Realize gingivitis or periodontitis may not represent the total periodontal condition. Other conditions may also be present, such as gingival recession, occlusal trauma, frenum positioning, so when we're talking about um, diagnosis, we're also going to need to consider other things that might be affecting the diagnosis. Occlusal trauma. Occlusal trauma is a big one. If you're constantly rocking and moving your teeth, you're going to have some, some tissue irritation. You're going to have some tissue soreness. Uh, the frenum position, if the frenum is constantly tugging, at the uh, marginal gingiva, it's going to result in some recession. It's going to also probably have some irritation associated with it. Documenting periodontal disease is a critical skill for the dental team. Adhere to a standard format for documentation. So in other words, diagnostic terms um, include descriptive modifiers. Um, you're going to use diagnostic terms like gingivitis, periodontitis, we don't just call it gingival inflammation, we're going to call it gingivitis. Um, disease stage, we're going to use the chart for staging, we're going to use the start chart for grading, and we're going to talk about the disease extent, localized or generalized. That's going to give you a good, solid diagnosis. So we have our disease stages. Stage one is like initial or early periodontitis or mild periodontitis. You could hear any of those words being used. Stage two is moderate. Stage three and stage four are both severe, but <coughs> the difference between them is stage three periodontitis, you may have the potential for additional tooth loss, where stage four periodontitis, you could have the potential for the loss of the whole dentition. Um, disease grading. So grade A is a slow progression, grade B is moderate, grade C is rapid. So we want to know how bad it, staging, by staging we want to know how bad is the disease today? What does it look like right now today? And our disease grading tells us and how fast is it going to progress? Is it going to progress slowly? Is it going to go at a moderate progression? Or is it going to progress rapidly? And then the extent localized, generalized, or molar incisor pattern. What molar incisor pattern means is there used to be something called um, aggressive, localized aggressive periodontitis. Localized aggressive periodontitis used to affect the incisors and the molars. And so when they talk about this molar incisor pattern, they're trying to account for taking away that um, descriptor. Normally, we're going to have localized or generalized. So um, in documenting disease, we're going to have the disease stage, the disease grade, and the disease extent. So stage one, again, is like equivalent to mild or initial periodontitis. Stage two is moderate. Stage three, severe. Stage four, they're calling advanced, just to give it a different name than severe. I think the chart might say severe, but it's still a form of severe. It's just got the more advanced um, potential for tooth loss versus uh, potential for um, dentition loss than just tooth loss. And then grade A, slow, moderate, and rapid. Localized is 30% or less, and generalized is more than 30% are involved. So here's an example of a diagnosis. You could have localized stage one grade A periodontitis. That's how you would write the diagnosis. So case types. We used to use something called case types. 
Case type one was gingivitis. So if you were to take these case types and convert them, case types one, case type one would be gingivitis. Case type two would be mild. Case type three would be moderate. And case type four would be severe. They had a case type five that was refractory as well. I think insurance is probably the only one that uses case types. Guidelines for periodontal treatment sequencing. OK, so this is how we're going to do our treatment plan. Your treatment plan is a sequential outline of measures to be carried out by the dentist, dental hygienist and patient to eliminate disease and restore a healthy periodontal environment. Coordinates and sequences all treatment and education established estimates length of time required for comprehensive treatment. Communication with the patient is vital and patient consent for proposed treatment must be obtained. So when we talk about the treatment plan, um, we draw up a treatment plan here that's all geared toward our periodontal treatment plan. Um, there's also a treatment plan that you're going to draw up that's going to encompass the entire um, scope of the patient's needs. So when you're like in a private practice, let's say the patient comes in and the patient is having has a toothache and the tooth needs a root canal, but the patient hasn't been to the dentist in 15 or 20 years. So you're not going to just address that tooth and say, OK, let's just do a root canal on tooth number 30. We're going to draw up a comprehensive treatment plan. So you're going to do perio charting. You're going to do um, restorative charting. Now, of course, you're going to first address the patient's pain um, needs, possibly by even doing the root canal that day to get the patient out of pain. Your number one goal is always to get the patient out of pain. But your overall treatment plan, you're going to include um, treating the patient's periodontal condition but you're also going to include treating the patient's restorative condition. So there's five phases of a periodontal treatment plan. So assessment and preliminary therapy phase. So the first phase is assessment and preliminary therapy. Then you've got non-surgical periodontal therapy or phase one. Surgical therapy is phase two. Restorative therapy is phase three, and perio maintenance therapy is phase four. Your assessment and preliminary therapy phase is the first phase. You're going to do your data collection, your med history, your EOE, your IOE, and your restorative charting. Then you're going to do your care for your immediate treatment needs. So you're going to take them out of pain. Taking a patient out of pain is always going to be your first priority. If the patient comes in and they've got an abscess and they're in a lot of pain, you're not going to start talking to them about scaling and root planing. You're going to address their pain first. Um, then comprehensive clinical periodontal assessment. You're going to probe. You're going to do your re chart your recession. You're going to chart your furcations, your mobility. This stage is also referred to as emergency therapy. In clinic, it's known as data collection. So you're going to do your data. The assessment and preliminary therapy continued. Procedures include health history, a comp exam, data collection, radiographs, treatment of urgent conditions, planning non-surgical treatment, Refer, referral if needed for medical conditions. So let's say the patients um, got really high blood pressure that day. You might, you're going to want to refer them to their physician to have their blood pressure con condition addressed. And then extraction of hopeless teeth. So hopeless teeth are teeth that you know, um, maybe they're broken off at the gum line and there's nothing but a root tip there. Um, maybe they've decayed the whole tooth all the way across, um, so it's going to be considered hopeless. Um, anything that can't be treated is hopeless and needs to come out. 
So think about when you're in clinic and you're doing your data collection, you take your radiographs. Um, this is all stuff that's done before you have your doctor exam. You're going to um, talk about, you're going to figure out non-surgical treatment, you're going to get your radiographs, all your data, you're going to already know if you need a medical consult for a medical condition. Phase one, non-surgical periodontal therapy is to control gingivitis and periodontitis, including periodontal instrumentation. So that was your assessment and preliminary phase. Phase one therapy um, is your non-surgical periodontal therapy. So it's to control gingivitis and periodontitis, including periodontal instrumentation. Dental hygiene care and educational measures are done. You're going to minimize the impact of local contributing factors as much as possible and also control back, um, also called con bacterial control and anti-infective therapy. So in this phase, this is going to be your phase. So phase one is your phase. This is actually the second kind of um, category, but it's called phase one treatment because the first one I may have mistakenly called that phase one. It's step one, the assessment phase. Then this is phase one or step two. This is where you're going to come into play, non-surgical periodontal therapy. Your non-surgical periodontal therapy is also going to include self-care education. In other words, you're going to go over OHI with the patient. Nutritional counseling. Um, it may be something as simple as um, telling them that they need to cut back on the amount of sugar that they eat. Maybe they drink 10 cans of Coke a day and you want to advise them to stop doing that. Um, nicotine cessation. Maybe you're going to talk to them a little bit about quitting smoking those two packs a day. Instrumentation, of course, you're going to be doing scaling and replaning at that time. Antimicrobial therapy, so um, if you're going to do like any kind of arrestin or anything like that. Correction of local risk factors. Um, one, so you're going to work on talking to them about any local risk factors that they have. Um, could be something like um, calculus on their teeth. It could be crowded teeth anything like that that you're going to work on. Fluoride therapy, if they need fluoride, it carries control and temporary restorations. Um, occlusal therapy, so they tell you they grind their teeth or clench their teeth at night. So you might work on um, talking to them about an occlusal guard. Orthodontic therapy, do they have severely crowded teeth that are making home care very difficult? Um, and then reevaluation of phase one therapy. So phase one would be your scaling and replaning through your reevaluation. So your periodontal reevaluation or your reevaluation of your scaling and replaning is also part of phase one therapy. This question I know is important or this um, keeping this in mind is very important. Phase two is your surgical therapy. So you've completed your non-surgical scaling and replaning and they've come for their reevaluation. Now we have to decide where do they go next? Do they go to phase two and need surgery or are they stable and okay and they can go to phase three and do their restorative treatment? So usually they're, I mean, they don't always follow every, every one of these uh, phases in sequence because a lot of times they don't need surgical therapy or they don't need implants or root canals. So they're going to jump right over to phase three, restorative therapy. Maybe they don't need any restorative therapy, so they might skip phase four and jump right into phase five periodontal maintenance. Nobody's going to skip phase five. So ongoing care at specified intervals, so three months perio maintenance. All measures used to keep periodontitis under control. So at this point, you're going to review home care. Um, you're going to put them, keep them on a three month perio maintenance. Maybe it's going to be two month perio maintenance whatever it takes to keep their periodontitis controlled. This phase used to maintain teeth functioning throughout life, and the goal is to prevent recurrence of disease. So many patients will remain in the 
phase four periodontal maintenance phase for life. This is just another picture of those phases. So the reevaluation um, in phase three, going back to um, slide 27, it says reevaluation of overall response to treatment. That is different than your reevaluation for um, scaling a replay. So let's say your patient comes in and your patient has um, a comp exam and they need scaling and replaning. They come in and they do scaling and replaning. You do your reevaluation of your scaling and replaning and decide that they need some periodontal surgery and they also need a couple of restorations placed. So they're going to then go to the next phase or phase two surgical therapy and they're going to have their surgical therapy done. Then they're going to move to phase three and do their restorative therapy. At the end of that, they're going to have a reevaluation of overall response to treatment. So now we're going to be reevaluating everything. The scaling or replaning, the surgery, the restorations. That's the reevaluation of everything. Um, the need for ongoing decision making. Needs change. A periodontal diagnosis and plan for therapy at one point in time may require modification at a later date. It is important to communicate the possibility of change in plan to the patient. So a patient could be in the periodontal maintenance phase and then they have a recurrence of disease. Maybe it's only a localized area, an area that's difficult for them to keep clean. And so you decide you wanna do some retreatment of scaling and replaning in an area that's pretty typical with your perio patients is that they kind of bounce around a little bit. They don't always stay um, stable for life. In fact, most of the time they don't. Um, so they might bounce back over to phase one again and need scaling and replaning again, or even if it's just localized. The need for adjustment. Periodontal care requires adjustment over time because the periodontium is dynamic and continuously changes over time. It's subject to physiologic tissue remodeling and it's subject to periodontal destruction throughout lifetime of the tooth. So your periodontal condition can change at any time. Clinical decision-making and treatment planning is ongoing and it continues to evolve over time. concludes chapter 10. We're going to go into treatment planning a little more in depth as we go through and continue to see patients in clinic and um, have clinical experiences. We'll be doing treatment planning.